Did spectators at a joust ever do the wave? Or if they were bored, they swat a beach ball around? Were jousting knights introduced like modern boxers in this corner of the Black Knight? Let's get ready to joust. Did jousters fight to the death or just to win a lady's handkerchief? Hopefully a clean one. These and other questions will be answered right after this. I am Professor Jerome Arkenberg, and I have been teaching a wide variety of history courses at colleges across this country for the past 30 years. In this video, I'm going to tell you about where and when tourneys first emerged, how joust and tourneys were organized, why knights jousted, and how tourneys changed into jousts. At the end, I'll have the wrap-up quote on this video. But first, make sure to click like, share, and especially subscribe, and that little bell thingy, so I can continue to bring you more great videos just like this one. Tourneys first appeared in northern France in the early 12th century, essentially as war games. They came to be held in all seasons except Lent, and any day of the week except Friday, the day in which the Lord died, and Sunday, the Lord's Day. Given that most knights were young men, and they were young, between 14 and 25, filled with testosterone in a culture predicated on pride and honor. These mock battles were popular ways to satisfy not only your own bloodlust, but also deal with perceived slights and disses against you. They also became a prime way to accumulate wealth. Since victors received the armor, weapons, and horses of those they defeated, which they could then either sell, trade, substitute for their own, or give out as fiefs and wind up with their own vassals. Tourneys were also a great way to get a reputation, especially if you start out as a regular common knight. In other words, your dad is not a big lord. If you get a reputation as being not just honorable, but a good Tourney knight, a great lord such as a duke or a king, would be anxious to have you in his service, not only for your war fighting skills, but of course, your rep. And you yourself would get better fiefs, more wealth, and hopefully, maybe, an advantageous marriage. Maybe the lord's own daughter which would then propel you and your family into the ranks of the upper nobility. And think of it in this way, kind of like a modern athlete who's coming from nothing, but gets a reputation, football, basketball, hockey, baseball, soccer, whatever, as a great athlete, one that everyone in order to contend wants on their team. Of course, you yourself would want to be not on the team, spending your entire career on the team that always loses, but on the team that actually has a shot or is known for winning the Super Bowl, the World Series, the Stanley Cup, the NBA championship, whatever. And besides that big payday, you also have a great shot at getting a girlfriend who is a supermodel or maybe even the boss's daughter. You've got it made at that point. Regular circuits arose, and like league play, 
where hundreds of knights, sometimes thousands, would attack each other in ways little different from a real battle, including severe maiming and death. Now, they're not supposed to kill each other, but, you know, accidents happen. And this might at first be on simply a large plane. The Lord owns it. Okay, so what if it has the crops on which peasants are growing food? Who cares that the crops are trampled and destroyed? After all, they're only peasants. And the land might contain several villages to be held as strong points, or a place from which to launch an ambush. At which point, the villagers, if they're smart, would flee. Or perhaps, instead, they would be beaten, raped, or killed as part of the battle. After all, they're peasants. And remember, the knights are really just gangbangers anyway. Tourneys were normally proclaimed at least two weeks in advance. The host would send out heralds and messengers to be held at a certain time and place. Hopefully the villagers would hear about this in advance and flee. The host would then set up wooden stands for hundreds of spectators. Nobility, of course, not common serfs, please. For hundreds of spectators who came to watch, again, sometimes thousands of knights attack each other, maiming each other, beating the crap out of each other. Kind of like many people would go to see a rugby game, football, or hockey. Not so much baseball. These knights would arrive individually or as part of a company, essentially a team, and then set up camp in one of two designated settlements on the field, kind of like the red team versus the blue team, whatever the host calls it. And they would go wherever they pleased or wherever their company's leader went. Then they would attend parties in their own settlement thrown by the attorney's patrons and other great noblemen. On opening day, the knights would parade in, as seen here, as two hosts, one from each settlement, followed then by a few individual joust, at first to blood, and a young knight's present. Yeah, you go get him, Friedrich. Gottfried, go get him. Around mid-morning, the two hosts would line up for a charge at either end of the field. Depicted here, not well, given the size of the picture, but let's say the red team versus the blue team on one side. And at a signal, they would ride at full gallop with level lances. Those not unhorsed on the first attack, or those not killed or maimed, would then turn quickly and attack each other with squires available to offer up to three replacement lances apiece. And of course, if you were knocked down or you surrendered, you would have to give your parole, your word, that you would retire from the fighting until you have been released by the person who has unhorsed you. The tourney then usually descend into chaos as knights sought to cap capture each other for ransom until exhaustion or twilight ensued, after which they would drink and feast, giving prizes to the best knights. And of course, those who were captured would have to ransom it up, usually, of course, by giving them the victor, their horse, their weapons, and their armor. However, by 1350, the tourney faded in favor of the joust, where knights were to neither kill nor maim each other during rounds. First three, later up to 12, kind of like in boxing rounds, with different attacks by battle axes or swords, even daggers. Sometimes these knights would simply fight entirely on foot. Of course, Really what people come to see is the knight on horseback. Now, why does the tourney fade? Well, increasingly, it is becoming difficult to have enough knights around as warriors. 
there are other opportunities to get ahead in the world, like law or administration or being an estate steward. You don't have to kill anymore or get up and fight like this. So knights become valuable. And even though, of course, in the first tourney, the lords did not want their knights killed, it would happen, but this way, there's less chance of the knight being killed. Like the tourney, the joust took place on an open field. But by the 14th century, a cloth barrier became common to separate them. Again, trying to make sure the knights aren't actually killing each other. And then in the 15th century, a wooden barrier, which is what you mostly see in your typical movie about knights doing jousting. This, of course, is to prevent collisions, making it easier to control both horse and lance, all the while wearing specialized jousting armor, weighing twice as much as regular battle armor. Again, to ensure, kind of like football players who, if you follow American football, at first wore no padding and no helmets. And then after 1905, when about 10 of them, 10, 12 of them died on the field from injuries, they started to get pads and helmets. And now they're really not designed to be hurt at all. And the same goes with the Knights. The wrap up quote. Tournaments were not originally held as a way of capturing horses, but so as to learn who was manly in his conduct, and to do great deeds of arms, because of which one would venture to trust such a man to lead great companies of knights, so that it would be known in truth and without doubt that at need he would persist in the assault and help and support his men and perform great deeds." and so that it would be known that he would wear a helmet, despite the heat and lack of air within, as lightly as he would wear his cloth cap. For the man who in such a situation is soaked in his own blood and sweat, this we call the High Bath of Honor. Henry de Leon, 1192. So, let me know what you think of this quote in the comment section below. Also, what you liked about this video and what other historical topics or subjects you'd like to see in future videos. Be sure to click like, share, especially subscribe, as it will help me bring you more great videos. And click on that little bell thingy so you'll know when the next History Waits for No One video is posted. If you want to know more, there are recommended studies on this topic in the description below, along with other ways to connect with me. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the past.